Hi everybody, I'm Jen LeBlanc. I'm here to talk about resonance and animism and really how to use the human voice to communicate with nature. I'll give you a little preview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to go over animism, modern and ancestral, really just what it is and what it isn't. I'll tell you about my personal journey and really the experiences that sort of got me where I am today called the Hagstone and the River Singer. We'll go over consciousness, some theories, waves, resonance, connection. I'll talk about sound a little bit and the basics of sound. We won't get too involved in that one. I really love going over living vocal traditions. They're beautiful and they've survived for some thousands of years. We will go over toning and what toning is. We'll talk about finding your own voice and how to make room for yourself. I wanna talk about how nature speaks, a few examples that really tie in to all the other things I talk about today. And at the end, I get a little bit philosophical and talk about my feelings about time and how sound transcends it. This is a quote from a Kume documentary, but I will show you a piece of later. Do not doubt when one tells you that I speak to the mountain, water, and grass. It is because beautiful nature is a great composer itself and transmits its own creations to human beings through gifted performers. The animistic worldview. Generally, animism is a way of experiencing the world in a unified and holistic manner. And it acknowledges the experience of non-human beings as well as human beings. It's a close relationship and reverence for nature, and it's infused with conscious equality, which is a very important component of it. It is a multi-dimensional, ever-changing reality. That's a quote from a favorite academic of mine, Ari Perrier. The term itself first appeared in a British anthropology book, Primitive Cultures, in 1871. It was really a blanket term and it was used to describe spirituality encountered by Western anthropologists in the field, but it was used in a pejorative fashion um, to describe what was considered simple and primitive sort of proto-religion used in a derogatory way, essentially seen as a proto-religion that was no longer valid in an analytical, scientific, and monotheistic modern society. It was imaginary and delusional, where modern religion was elegant and refined. And this attitude persisted well before 1871, before the term was coined. But such limited perception led to decades of mechanistic dissection of the world in the hope of finding an explanation to the larger questions of life and reality. And I think we can all agree we have not really found all those answers yet. There are a lot of misconceptions about what animism is. It's not the idea that all things have a soul because the soul is a human construct and applying it to other beings is not only inappropriate, but it's never gonna really result in an accurate understanding of those beings. We really have designed it to apply only to ourselves. So using that term limits our validation of the experience of other beings. And it's also not a religious concept. Some people mistakenly claim that it's religious and it really has nothing to do with religion. It's not the idea that things are simply animated being animated implies they're filled with life and movement. Science has designated the characteristics of life and many non-human beings do not fit into them. So not fitting into them does not indicate a lack of experience or existence. It's simply that they don't, they can't be defined by the list that we've created for what life is. And we know that some of them do not move as we move. Sentience is a bit tricky so it really requires an emotional response based on its general definition. There's a feeling or an emotion, but other beings are engaged in a complex experience that's unique to them. So limiting 
their emotional response system to ours or using ours as a model for that, it's really not appropriate either. It's a little bit egocentric and fairly misleading. We cannot assume that they are having the same emotional experience that we are. We are engaged in a conscious dance of attunement with everything that exists. Animism is the weaving of reciprocity and the intimacy of that connection. On a fundamental level, it is a feedback loop of vibrational input and response, a highly complex continuous relationship between beings, and it's fundamentally symbiotic Currently there's a resurgence in animism. People are really excited about it. It's being used in place of the term shamanic, which I appreciate because I think the term shaman and shamanic has been overused to the point where it's not always being used appropriately or correctly, which can create some confusion. Animism is not a veneration or a belief but it's a highly practical and intentional recognition that all things are equally significant, that all things engage with their environment in a variety of complexities, and that all things are capable of some level of response, even if only on the quantum scale. Animism is an engagement, an intentional engagement with everything that exists in the universe. my personal experiences, my little stories. So I wanna start, a little front load, a hagstone. If you've not heard of a hagstone, they are considered sacred objects. They are basically a hole with, sorry, they are a stone with a hole passing through it that is typically created by water over time. They have many names that have been used to describe them. A witch stone, adder stone, a hex stone, a fairy stone, holy stone, Odin stone. I could go on. So with that information in mind, caretaking. Now I want to remind you that the animistic worldview is created through direct reciprocity. So you are engaging all the time. After I moved into my current home that was next to a river, I began cleaning the river. Now I, I started because I was just a bit annoyed that there was glass in it or rusted things, a lot of bricks, a shocking number of bricks. And I just didn't want them in there. They didn't belong in the river. And my scientific knowledge and study told me that they were probably harming the river, especially some of the rustier bits and garbage. So I just started cleaning it. And I cleaned it probably every time I visited for a number of years. I really didn't have a goal other than cleaning and caretaking. I love the river. I wanted it to be healthy. I wanted it to have wildlife. It was really done out of deep love. After a few years, I began to sing to the river because I was practicing Galder and I learned toning and it seemed to be a really beautiful gift. So up, oh, that's me this year. Uh, I started finding little gifts here and there and I didn't really necessarily consider them gifts from the river at the time. Uh, my favorite is this ring that I wear. I was particularly sad one day and I went down to the river hoping that I could find some solace and I could find some comfort. And I found this ring and something other, another interesting tidbit. And I remember thinking that, oh, the, the river is proposing, the river loves me. We're gonna, you know, we're engaged. Which is not actually an abnormal idea. Historically, people have married the land. And you can look that up if you want more information about that. I really never expected anything back from the river, but I really appreciated the things I got. So one day, I was sitting with my partner and I remember saying, I've never found a hagstone, but I really love to. They're very important. They're very sacred and I really want one. And a few minutes later, I found one. 
that was a neat trick. <laughs> so, and a few minutes later, I found another one. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I think it took about an hour to find 13 that day, which I made note of. So I stated clearly that I wanted a thing, and suddenly I had 13 of them. It almost felt like the river was throwing them at me. And that was a little odd. At this point, I have found almost 40. I find them almost every time I go to that river, and quite often any river. It really was the first clue that something interesting was going on, and I wanted to know more about it. So I became curious. Over time, I decided that it was some sort of introduction of communication. I took care of the river for a long time and did not realize it was trying to communicate until I gave it a pretty direct way to do so. So I was curious, can I actually communicate to non-human entities? What does science have to say about this? And is there any intersection of science and spirituality that offers answers? Because I knew there probably wouldn't be a straight scientific answer to, can I communicate with a river? Let's be honest at this point. So I didn't want to force other entities to find a way to communicate with me. It, it was really important for me to try to figure out how to communicate in a way that made sense with it as much as it could make sense. My animistic perspective really emphasized respect and mutuality. So I wanted to figure out how I could communicate in a way that didn't require any sort of real translation. What do both organic and inorganic matter have in common? The only thing that I could figure out or that I came to was vibration. Everything has a vibration. So in turn, everything has a frequency and technically a sound of some kind because vibration is sound or sound is vibration. I immediately became obsessed with all types of sounds, <laughs> every single one and anything natural, of course, not man-made. I was mostly interested in natural sounds that were created by the environment, by the earth, by the moon. And through my toning, I be began to mimic as many sounds as I could, which is trickier than it seems. And I'm not sure my partner always appreciated everything that I did, all the odd sounds that I made. Thankfully, it wasn't in public at this point. I wanted to share some of the sounds that I encountered in my journey because they're pretty interesting. Hopefully this works. My cacophony of sounds. So this. That's the sun, and later I have the planets. This is mushroom. I didn't expect that one. I believe these are the bearded seals, if I recall correctly, and they come in pretty, pretty hot, pretty loud. So everyone at this point should take a moment and try to mimic that sound. <laughs> so this is, these are plants. And what they've done is translate the electrical micro voltage into a soundscape so that you can experience it. And another interesting point is that you can purchase, download an app. I believe you have to purchase some biosensors, but you can listen to your own plants.
why not? Honestly. I find it's especially important to show the little moment where they touch the plant. There's a lot of interesting research about plants and their reaction. So I think a lot of people <laughs> that I talk to have at least heard a little bit about how they can scream. And the scream is kind of specific to oops, different threats, kind of interesting, the varied responses. So this is a planets and I will do a few and sort of end with my favorite, which you'll find out when we get there. All right, let me backtrack a little bit. These are electro electromagnetic vibrations that exist in space and they are mapped as sounds. So if you were wondering how this happened. <laughs> Sneak peek. So that last one is Titan. Moon of Saturn. But Saturn sounds like it's basically screaming through space. So it's very fascinating to me. Oops. Doing well technically today. So my spiritual awakening. So about a, about a year of listening to these odd sounds and really trying to figure out every sound I could and mimicking every sound I could. I took these sounds to the forest. I used to sing to the forest and the river, just trying to communicate. It really was what I was trying to do. And one day I was in an old, I was looking for an old copper mine in the next town over because I love rocks and I love rock hunting. And I began toning and attuning to the sounds of the forest, just really feeling them out. And I remember making a really strange buzzy kind of sound. And I was like, I'm just gonna go with this. This is, I feel like I'm getting into it. I don't hear that sound anywhere, but that's what I'm feeling. And then I heard a cicada. And then I heard several cicadas. And all of a sudden the whole forest exploded into this deafening cicada. It, it literally sounded like I had awoken every cicada in the forest and they were all in chorus with me. And it was so loud and it definitely freaked me out. And I actually was talking to my partner about it last week and, and he remembers that and was like, I do not understand what happened there. <laughs> I'm like, well, I didn't either at the time, but it was really cool. So the next, it was a few days later. So all of this happened within a week, which is why it was got my attention. And that was the point in my opinion. So I was at another, another local band of mine and I was looking for rocks. And I decided before we left that I was gonna practice my cloning and I will show you what that is later. And I was, it's a very high pitched, oh, like a scream, which sounds awful, but it's beautiful. And as I was doing it, I noticed that someone started calling back. So I would make the sound and I was just practicing. I was perfect at it yet. And then someone else would do the sound back at me. And this went on a few times and I laughed and I said, Andy, I think someone's, I think someone's responding to me. That's fun. And then I noticed it was coming from my left.
and then from the right. Before I knew it, there were yips and calls coming from all around me. I had unintentionally apparently got the attention of an entire uh, pack of coyotes and decided that that was a good time to head on out. <laughs> so again, that, not really paying attention because first it seemed to be cicadas, now it's coyotes. So this one was the last event that really got my attention. I was hiking to a waterfall, a river and a waterfall that I had been to, I think once before, and I had sang to before. Previously, I'd faced away from the waterfall to sing in tone, not towards it. But for some reason this time, I turned and faced the falls and I began to tone. And after a minute or so, I was really trying to feel out the sound of the waterfall and what I was feeling from the waterfall. And I did feel a profound shift and my voice took on a, a vibrancy that I wasn't familiar with. And it seemed to blend with the sound of the water moving. And as this happened, it became louder and louder and louder. And I remember thinking, I'm very loud. I'm very loud, but this is louder than I can individually make. So this new sound that is being created is far louder than I am, than the falls are. And it's actually kind of freaking me out. <laughs> so I didn't stay there as long as I later wished I had. I regretted sort of falling out of it because I didn't understand what was happening. It definitely freaked me out quite a bit. It was deafening. And after processing and really thinking about the experience that I was having, I settled on the idea of resonance. I was resonating with the waterfall. The oscillation of actual entities is resonance and shared resonance is what results in the combination of consciousness. That's a quote from Tam Hunt. 2019, he put out um, a resonance theory of consciousness with another author, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Consciousness. Oh, that one coming. There's a lack of universally accepted definition for consciousness. There's a lot of fighting amongst various scientific communities about what it is, and spiritual communities. Basically, everybody disagrees which is fun because it makes for a lot of hot debates, but it doesn't really get us to a comfortable place. It's sort of a, most theories erroneously position humans to be the supreme consciousness that all beings and entities must be compared to, which immediately creates a bias system that favors only that which mirrors our consciousness or our perceptions of what consciousness is. And so we're really just looking for a consciousness that's like ours and in doing so, we're not really finding the answers that we want and need. I definitely don't presume to have all those answers. By any stretch of the imagination, that is not the game I'm playing today. But there are a few theories that I came across in my research that really intrigued me and really started to flow with the things that I was experiencing. So the idea of a feedback loop, that consciousness is a feedback loop, which is incredibly scientific. Basically, it's a system with a cycle of input or stimulus and output response. It's a little bit dry, but I still love it because it doesn't limit to just humans. Alfred North Whitehead, a mathematician and philosopher, described as an oscillation between subjective prehension and objective concrescence. That every entity goes through a cycle of sensing its environment and then deciding how to manifest the next moment. Deciding or responding. So basic facts. Vibration and frequency. Quantum field theory defines that all matter is essentially vibrations in quantum fields. All things vibrate and are in constant motion. Even stationary objects are vibrating and oscillating at various frequencies. 
All objects and mechanical systems have a natural frequency. My personal favorite, they may even have multiple natural frequencies depending on their geometry. Love geometry. Dr. Leroy Little Bear, who has my favorite doctor name in the history of doctor names, is a celebrated academic in a variety of fields and a Blackfoot Indian. A lot of deep respect for this man. He described the native paradigm an indigenous science consisting of several key points, which I feel are connected to what I'm laying out for you. That everything is in constant motion or flux. That everything exists and consists of energy waves. That energy waves are really spirit. And they were made of energy waves or a combination thereof. The resonance theory of consciousness. So Tam Hunt, an ethics lawyer and researcher with Jonathan Schooler, a PhD in psychology, described it as a synchronous vibrations. Resonance are not only the foundation of human consciousness, but general physical reality. You know, I love that. The resonance is a type of motion or oscillation between states. As two vibrating objects come into proximity, they begin to vibrate at the same frequency. And you guessed it, Resonance is the result. So the way that they explain different types of consciousness is that higher levels are directly related to the complexity of the entity. At the atomic level, each atom or some atomic particle can experience a little bit of consciousness, a limited consciousness. Subatomic particles are constantly engaging with other, other particles all the time, faster than we can even conceive, and responding to that engagement. Again, there's that feedback loop, I wanna remind you. So at the higher levels of organization, such as we are, you have a very complex consciousness because you are the result of, your macro consciousness is the result of countless layers of micro consciousness, right? So subatomic, atomic, cells, organs, organ systems, and on up, and then you have us. Biological systems are easier to comprehend. Oh my. Biological systems are easier to comprehend, but that does not invalidate other entities. I fear I must pause and plug in my computer. All right, I definitely thought I could squeeze in before I had to plug in part of my apologies. Sound. Sound is vibration. It propagates as an acoustic wave through a medium, typically air, but also water, soil. Sound is a form of energy, just like electricity and light. So the phonon is to sound as the photon is to light. And the sound is ma made when molecules vibrate and move in a pattern called waves or sound waves. Sound wave qualities. We have amplitude, which is volume compression and expansion, frequency pitch, cycles per second, wavelength is speed, the distance between compressions. I like to show you amplitude. I especially like this because it shows, raise up one time. It shows the amplitude is really compression and decompression of the air molecules. The air molecules are moving. They are actively involved in this process. I also wanted to show you the human auditory field because we can hear between 20 and 20,000 Hertz. We're on our own little variety of that ability to hear. We have infrasounds, elephants and moles, and I'm gonna to get to the elephants later, if you're curious about that, and ultrasounds, which are higher than that. Cats, dogs, bats, dolphins, So interesting new studies that are coming out. Sound has mass. That was a revelation, which they admitted they probably should have figured out before, but no one was looking. So they figured it out. Confirmed, sound has mass. The mass is interestingly gravitational and negative. So it sort of floats up and away. The phonons interact with the gravitational field in a way that requires them to transport mass as they move. So they really do move things. 
so they move molecules in a way that they don't just get excited and then go back to their their state they actually are moved in the process so that's exciting i want to talk about sound healing because i think that i'm sure it's been discussed several times and i know the keynote speaker of course discussed a form of sound healing it's not new it's very ancient the frequency of vibration that's most natural to the organ or the body that you're trying to heal Resonance plays a key role in the application and basis of treatment. Resonance principles are employed to reharmonize cells that have been hypothetically imprinted with disruptive frequencies, um, troublesome imprints, the results of toxic, toxic substances, emotional traumas, pathogens, long-term exposure to noise pollution. I mean, it's really, really trending, very popular. And of course, that makes me very happy. Honing. So toning is a sustained vibratory sound of single tones, and they're often vowels. The tone is held as long as possible and is typically held steady without intentional melody. Although when I do it, I do make a little bit of a melody, but I'm really trying to tune myself to the situation and what I'm trying to communicate with. It bypasses the use of phonetic language and replaces it with a more foundational frequency that is recognized by all beings. And much like a singing bowl, toning uses the human voice to create sound that reverberates. It's interesting that it was used in ancient Egypt. So there's some writings that indicate that the priests in Egypt would intone vowels. Quote, in Egypt, when priests sing hymns to the gods, they sing the seven vowels in due succession. And the sound has such euphony that men listen to it instead of the flute and the lyre. It's 2000 BC. It's interesting also that hieroglyphics contain no vowel sounds particularly or vowels and it could be theorized that it's due to the sacred nature that they were used to communicate with the divine and so not by the average person. I wanted to show this chart because it indicates the different chakras and the different sounds or vowel sounds that could be intoned for them and the notes that corresponds well. Honing clears and balances the energetic body. The breathing patterns relax the nervous system using combination with other healing modalities. It creates a resonance with our own body, which allows a deep connection to our own healing. And once you have achieved balance and connection with your energetic body, you can then utilize it to heal the larger environment and other beings as well. Which is sort of the point that I'm making in this whole presentation. The living traditions, my favorite part. Combing, this is a herd call. Traditionally used to call livestock down from the mountain pastures they've been grazing. It's typically 780 to 1560 hertz. It's very loud and very high pitched. Ornamental shouts in a minor scale. The female speaking voice is between 165 and 255 hertz. So this is significantly high pitched and loud. And some old recordings display lower tones. So you can understand that it's a very complex Tradition. Let's hear it. I wish I could play that one for the duration, but at one point all the cows come running and their beautiful bells are jingling. And I just love that part. Galdra, or Galdra singing is a Scandinavian tradition. It's a runic based on the Elder of Futhark. It's really used to create incantations and use it a, a powerful, powerful voice. A powerful breath and elongated tones again as you'll notice a theme in these long drawn out tones and really the intent is communicating to the universe so i wanted to use this beautiful video from facebook which always comes in mute <laughs> Oh, 
As you can see, she's getting louder and louder. Yoiking. This is a beautiful tradition from Sami of Northern Europe. It's used to express relationships to people in nature, to communicate with the earth. There are few to know lyrics. The Noadi or the Sami shaman typically performed the yoiks for the beating of a drum, contact the spirit worlds. I am sorry that I have to rush through some of these traditions. It's just that I tend to go over because I love them so much. Uh, throat singing. I'm focused on the Inuit of Northern Canada for this one, but you, there are multiple traditions of throat singing. There's deep emotional significance and they are imitating the sounds of nature and animals. This is very important to the culture. Deep respect for this tradition. Skip ahead. <coughs> very beautiful and unique tradition uh yeli i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly the baka pygmies in central africa this is polyphonic so there's different melodies sung simultaneously the distinctive yodeling technique so you'll see yodeling in different regions and typically the women sing and the men dance the song not to feel that one right in your right in your soul right in your heart. Uh, Kume is Mongolian tradition intended to imitate the sounds of nature. Um, so this is overtone singing. It's simultaneously emitting two distinct vocal sounds. There's a lower continuous drone sound and then the singer produces melodic harmonies in the same breath. That is very cool. I'm trying to learn this one. It's believed to be learned from birds whose spirits are central to their shamanic practices and shared it with them. The sound on this one isn't great, but I do like to show the traditional singers. But when one tells you that I speak to the mountain, water, and grass, it is because beautiful nature is a great composer itself and transmits its own creation to human beings through gifted performers. The exact origin of the Home art is unknown, but researchers suppose. 
I wish I could tell you that one for a long time. Finding your voice. Some of these traditions are not what is considered pretty. Our authentic voice is often not perfect as we would consider a beautiful singing voice. It's going to be vastly different than your speaking voice. It might take time to uncover. Uh, it took me a good year of practice. Often people feel uncomfortable or silly and it's really important to push past that because if you're starting to feel silly, you're feeling it in your body and you need to push through those uncomfortable ideas and keep going as you notice it seemed to be the foundational piece of many of these living traditions take a nice long deep breath and let it out slowly and allow your voice to flow through your body unencumbered i suggest practicing practicing alone in the beginning because it's going to be a little weird until you gain some confidence try making a lot of strange sounds when you sing it's really the way to experiment be curious. And the more you engage with your own powerful voice, the greater the gifts that reveal themselves. You will reveal yourself over time. New scientific studies. I'm going to breeze through these much faster than I like, but and I'm only going to touch on a little bit, trees and elephants. This is Susan Samard, an ecologist, a brilliant ecologist. She was the one that brought us the idea that roots we're communicating, so trees are communicating via the fungus you near know, their roots, a network of latticed fungus buried in the soil. In her research, she just put out a new book, Finding the Mother Tree, about her experiences, a brilliant woman. Ed Wagner, a PhD level physicist, at one point discovered evidence of plant communication via what he called W waves. I think he just didn't have another term for it, so he gave it that term. If you chop into a tree, you can see that adjacent trees put out an electrical pulse said Wagner. This indicates they communicate directly. And what he's referring to is that if you chop into a tree, instantaneously trees around it respond. Now chemical signals don't typically move that quickly. They can't. So what's going on there? Waves. And it was an electrical impulse signal that it was putting out. It's very fascinating research. Peter Wolmber, Wolmben, <laughs> I'm <laughs> destroying his name. Wolven, I hope. He's a German forester and author, The Hidden Life of Trees. It's a well-known book and how they communicate. Trees are far more alert, social, sophisticated, and even intelligent than we thought. Though so that communal colonies of deep interdependence communicate in a variety of ways previously thought absurd. It's a profound book and has a lot of information. I couldn't possibly do it justice in just a few seconds, but it is an important piece of work. I love this. So elephants. So infrasound is below our ability to hear. We don't have a system of listening as they do. It's lower than 20 hertz. They actually vibrate the base of their trunk near their skull. The vibrations are amplified by the honeycomb design of their skull. Uh, airborne, it can be heard two to three miles away by other elephants. So two to three miles away, we can't even hear it and they can. Underground, the seismic waves can be perceived up to 12 miles away. And it actually travels through their toes, up into their legs, into their ears. But also, there is somatosensory reception, vibration-sensitive cells in their feet and the tip of their trunk actually pick up the vibrations. That is amazing. That is communication through vibration. It's just, I just love it. I get very excited. And I, I'm sure you can see how this all plays in to the point that I'm trying to make. Vibration, resonance, sonic time machine. So this is where I get philosophical. We are almost finished, close to time. The concept of time is very tricky. There aren't many theories that really coagulate into a comfortable idea that everyone can agree on. Conscious human experience is limited by a linear perception of time, and we know that time can't just be linear. It can't be that easy. It's too complex. The advent of phonetic writing narrowed our focus to visual, and we lost a great deal of that unique auditory processing. So we used to sing and tell stories, and that's how we shared information. And we've lost that over time because of this focus on the visual, focus on 
phonetic writing and language that way and how to share information through writing. Sound, especially created by instruments or human voices, becomes a sonification of time and is not limited to a fixed point. Complex layering of the past and the present that reverberates forward. Sound allows us to experience transient time, often transforms into a layered oral experience. In this way, ancient sounds transcend time. Their vibrations transport us to primordial temporal experiences that still linger within our DNA and ripple through the water that chirally encases it. You know, water also has memory and chiral is that lack of mirroring and asymmetry. And there's water that encases our DNA. Sound is a profound storyteller if we can just remember how to listen. Echoes of the past can be accessed in the future. To sum up, vibrations are universal language. Sound can create vibrational connections between human and non-human entities. Resonance is a deep connection that allows a shared consciousness even for brief moments. Toning and traditional singing practices utilize the human voice to match the frequencies of non-human entities which manifest as a resonance. And the use of these traditional vocal songs enable us to facilitate connection with beings that seem to transcend time itself. Thank you for indulging me today. If you email me, I can send you a long list of my resources and work cited because I think that's incredibly valid and very important. Thank you.